Shalom, welcome to our continuing daily class in the books of Rabbi Nachman. We are in a new cycle, beginning the Kuti Moran from the first Torah on the first page. Torah Aleph, which is Ashrei Timimei Dorech. Fortunate is those who go innocently in the paths of the Torah of God. Now, this Torah is one that has been quoted many times for many reasons. But the first paragraph here gives us an equation that we need to understand very well. And he explains it. Da ki aidea Torah nitkablim kola tefilot bakashot shanachu mivakshim mitpalalim. That through the learning of Torah, our prayers and our requests are answered. Va'achen ha'chashivut shel Yisrael nitalev nitromem b'fnei kol mishetrichim. And our importance and our grace is elevated in the eyes of those for, from whom we need such grace. Now, it's an interesting phrase, this idea of needing grace. Or, But remember, this was written in a time when we didn't have sovereignty, we didn't have Eretz Israel, we didn't have any of the things that the Jewish people have today. Back then, it was a dream that we would have Eretz Israel, that we would have our own army, that we would have our own government, that we would have the ability to govern ourselves. So that was just a distant dream back then. But today it's true. And you see that all these good things that happen to us somehow go back and trace themselves to our relationship to prayer and learning. And he's going to explain this relationship and how they interact, the symbiosis between how prayer opens up the heart to learn better and Learning opens up the tefillah to pray better, and they're giving to each other back and forth as we climb the ladder of spirituality. So he continues, although with a with a very sober note, and he says that ki akshav b'avonotenu ar rabim chen v'chashivut ha'amiti shlisrael nafal that the grace and the importance of the Jewish people has fallen. Because right now, when he was writing this, right, the essential importance in the eyes of the people was by the non-Jews. In this case, the Russians, the followers of the Tsar. But again, he repeats the idea that the, the, by learning and davening, we elevate the importance of the Jewish people in the eyes of the world. So you see that the world doesn't judge us by how much money we make or by how well we do in, in, in various disciplines. Because the disciplines of the world, sciences, mathematics, the stock market, all these types of activities, they're important to making a living and to making discoveries. But they're not necessarily Jewish. And so what's necessarily Jewish, which gives us the stamp of identity, is the Torah and is the lifestyle that the Torah dictates for us. The lifestyle of purity, of honesty, of directness, of healthy boundaries, of our yearly cycle of celebration, the life cycles that are woven into Judaism, all of these things the world looks at them and wonders, that, oh, these Jews are crazy, they don't eat milk and meat, they don't eat pig, they don't... No, they know those things, but it, they're, they're kind of like, eh. You know, it's a way of, of discounting it. But when they really look at it, they know there's something happening. When they see that every week the Jews closes his shop and goes home and has, you know, a family dinner and goes to the synagogue and et cetera, et cetera, they know there's something here. There's, the Jews have something special. But if we don't keep that, then they're not going to see that. So by keeping it and by our prayers being answered, the nations look up to us, even if they don't like it. Because ultimately, people deep in their hearts believe that there is a creator. There is something behind this grand experiment called the universe. And that something is spelled with a capital S, you know, something. There's something there driving this story forward in history. And so the, the importance of the Jews rises with the Torah and it falls when we leave it. Ki a Torah nikret ayelet ahavim yalat chen. The 
It means literally the elet avim, the um, the elevation of the beloved, and the el- and the lifting of the grace. Shema lechen alomdeah, because the people who learn Torah, it gives them more grace. Okay, and that grace is important. It can, now the word chen in Hebrew is interesting. We translate it as grace, but it's really how other people receive you, how other people engage you. And you have to kind of watch people, how they treat each other, and compare that to the way Jews are supposed to, and many times do, treat each other. Now, when I, I was raised as a secular Jew, and I went, first went to yeshiva as a 30-year-old, and I looked, I saw that these people really did treat themselves better. They, there was more respect, there was more uh, manners that I had expected to see. And that's part of what the Torah gives you. It gives us a way of speaking, a way of honor, a way of kavod, which is the idea of the intrinsic value of every human being. Now the Rebbe goes on to tell us that when this grace is lifted, that our prayers are accepted. Now what's going on here? Meaning that if the, the nations look at the Jews and say, oh, these are special people, God's going to answer my prayers? Well, you see, God is very much interested in His name, in His reputation, in the fact that He created the human race in order to recognize Him and to praise and to sing and to dance and to celebrate their own existence, not to use existence as an opportunity to take advantage of each other. And so when the, <clears throat> the nations see the Jews keeping the Torah, God has an interest in answering our prayers because it makes them look up to Him. Wow, God's answering the prayer of the Jews. I want God to answer my prayers. If I was a non-Jew, that's certainly how I would think. If I was you know, exposed to these ideas and exposed to these kinds of people. I want God to answer my prayers. Why is God answering the Jews' prayers? What are they doing that's so much better than me? So God is intrinsically involved with this relationship because he, His name is woven into our success. Especially now, after 2,000 years of exile and coming back to the land, there will never be another holocaust. There will never be another flood. There will never be another <clears throat> destruction like we've seen for thousands of years because our name is carrying His name. Our reputation is is intrinsically involved in the repetition of his Torah, which is a living document of his presence. So we have to understand this. And, and any king understands this. If I'm a king and I hire you to, to represent me in another country, don't I expect you to represent me in a, in a noble and honorable and dignified way? Of course I do. What am I paying you for? To show up to, <laughs> to show up in jeans, you know, for the coronation of the queen? So we can use that metaphor, and it's used over and over and over in Hasidic thought, especially the metaphor of the king, his people, his kingdom, and his running of the kingdom. And he goes on to tell us, Ki isha Yisraeli tzarich tamid l'stakel b'hasechel shel kol devar. Now he introduces a new idea. That a Jewish person needs to look at the intelligence in each and everything that is in his life. The intelligence. You have a paper clip on your, on your desktop. There's actually intelligence woven into that paper clip. Or the pack of matches on your on your cigarette stand or the light bulb that's flickering whatever you see around you there's intelligence embedded in it and the jewish mind is designed to discover the importance and the wisdom and the intelligence that's embedded in that now this is essentially a kind of a take 
on the empirical scientific method of how to look at the world. And certainly science has made leaps and bounds in the last hundred years. And when we look at the way scientists look at the world, it's, it's very, very close to the way the Torah is teaching us to look at the world, to find the intelligence. But he says, We need to look at things and the intelligence embedded in them. Why? Why do we need to? Why can't I just go on my happy way? Why do I need to spend time meditating why the shadows come at this hour at this angle and the dew on the grass is dried at this time and then the the birds leave the tree at this time and why why do i need to pay attention to those things i'm not an ornithologist i'm not a biologist why why do i need to see that intelligence why do you think well i'm sure out there in facebook land you understand that the intelligence that's embedded in creation comes from a source. And that intelligence is our creator. And he created this world to show us his intelligence, which is a mighty big thing indeed. And he wants us to find that intelligence. And to attach ourselves into the wisdom and intelligence that is in every single thing. So, you know, if you try to do this, you'll see your, your day is going to be a very different kind of day. It's going to take a long time just to get out of your office or into, from your bedroom to your car. You know, <laughs> because you're going to find yourself surrounded with intelligence that we take for granted. And the taking of granted of things is a, a sad fact of human nature, but we can break that. We can change that. And why do we need to find the intelligence in a thing? Because that seichel, that seichel, that intelligence will reflect back to us. It will shine its intelligence into our mind and make us more intelligent. That is in every single thing. And to get closer to God through that very thing. Because when you get closer to the intelligence in a thing, you're getting closer to the intelligence of God. Because the intelligence is a great light and it illuminates him in all his ways. As it is written by King Solomon, the, the wisest of men, Chachmot Adam Te'ir Panav, that the wisdom of a person illuminates his face. You've seen people like that, that their face shines. And they happen to be actually very wise people. Now that doesn't mean they're wise in every single type of wisdom that's out there. But they live wisely. And they know how to choose wisely. And they know what things are important and what are less important. And this idea of the the wisdom of man will illuminate his face is the idea of Jacob, our forefather Yaakov, ki Yaakov zacha lebechora shehu reshit. Because Yaakov merited to the idea of the firstborn, which is the first portion of a thing. There is power in the first portion of a thing. Yaakov called Reuven, his first and oldest son, Reshit Oni. Reshit Ono, excuse me. And, and so that Ono is his power. That, that the first child in a series of children in a family oftentimes is the most powerful for various reasons. But he's telling us here this is not just uh, exclusive to children. Okay, that the first effort you make in something can often be your greatest effort. And uh, this goes on in, in, in every aspect of life. And this idea of the first effort or the first power is connected to this idea of the firstborn, which is this idea of Jacob taking the firstborn, taking the Bechorah from Esav, because Esav was not a moral man. Esau was not a person who put moral behavior first. 
And that was how Jacob was able to buy the, the, the rights of the firstborn from his brother. They were twins, but Esau came out first. And, and Jacob understood who his brother was. He says, I got to get this, this Bechora back, this power of my father's blessing. So sibling rivalry, rivalry is a very common thing in the Bible, and I guess it's still pretty common today in a lot of families, unfortunately. But you'll see that there, the, the, the rivalry is oftentimes based on the different talent and skill sets of the people. And that creates animosity, creates jealousy, it creates imbalance. And it's, it, you know, being a father and a grandfather, I could tell you, it's not so easy to balance those loyalties and the, to make sure that you love all of them equally. But on that subject, I could say this. If you have the great love of God, then you love everything. And your children are my children. And, and your success is my success. And that's the great love, in a nutshell. And if I worry more about my kids than your kids, then I still haven't touched the great love. And the great love, of course, is God's love for everything because He is infinite and His love is infinite. So I think this is a great place to stop right now for the first uh, evening of our new cycle of Lakuti Moran. We're going to be back tomorrow and continue this amazing work. And it's going to illuminate us and it will make your face shine and it will make you smile, <laughs> even for no reason. And so we look forward to seeing you again and tell your friends that we've begun a new cycle and that we are looking forward to new insights, new illuminations, new inspirations, because the world is on the move and we're moving with her. God bless. See you tomorrow.